Hello, everyone. So this first chapter is just going to be on the first chapter of the book, which you've seen. I've showed you this one here. Um, we are just going to talk, generally speaking, about how we understand disability in this kind of like big umbrella kind of way. So how do we conceptualize functioning, disability, health, and that kind of thing? That's what we're going to be covering today. So actually, let's do this. OK, so in rehabilitation counseling for a long time, we've had this understanding that the way we see people with disabilities and the way we understand disability itself is a little bit missing some of what's important to know about how do we conceptualize this stuff. So let's take a road, uh, a road back into history and we'll first talk about the medical model. So when, say like 100 years ago, 1920s, something like that, we used to think of disability as something that happens to you and it's a kind of an ailment or a problem or something that deviates from what's good. In other words, when doctors would say, you have a disability, you've lost your sight, you've lost your hearing, you've lost a limb, um, all kinds of things, you've lost functioning in some way, that's a medical problem. And that means that there's something to fix and we need to compensate for that by giving you a prosthetic or uh, giving you tools that you can use to help you navigate the world so that you can see kind of again. <laughs> and even still, we're, we're still doing this kind of thing. When we uh, build prosthetics, when we build robotics, when we build uh, apps that help people navigate that kind of thing, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just limiting. Um, it tends to focus on the disease inside of a person, um, and the person is the, in, is the, the individual is a passive recipient of care. So if I say, doctor, something's not working, my arm just fell off, he's going to say, well, okay, I'm the doctor, I'm the professional, I'm going to fix it. You just sit there and let this stuff happen and you cope with it, basically. Um, there's a big emphasis on pathology, which means that uh, emphasizing the problem. So when a doctor comes into the, the office and your arm is falling off and he says, what can I do? I got to figure this out. He says, well, I got to find the problem. So pathology is just saying what's wrong with you. And it's an emphasis on that as opposed to what we're going to talk about in a little bit up here, which is what's working for you and what's your what are your strengths and that kind of thing. The idea then is in some cases you can fix the arm that fell off, but in other cases there is something going on inside your body like a, a bacteria or a virus or something like that. And in some cases the goal is to remove a disease or a dysfunction. So if I can remove the sickness, if I can get rid of your cold or your strep throat or your whatever, I can take it away by giving you medications, then you go back to normal, quote unquote, and so that fixes you essentially. The, difficult, the difficulty in this is accommodating chronic or permanent conditions. So like, for example, if I have an amputation, I'm missing a limb or missing a, you know, one of my fingers or toes, or I have a chronic condition that really can't be cured or it can't, we can't make it go away, then the doctors are kind of stuck because they say, well, we can't fix it, so there's nothing we can do for you. It's, we just can't accommodate that kind of thing. And that's, that's why some of these other models that we'll talk about in a second. So the, the last bullet point here, diagnostics don't emphasize functioning within the context of real life. What that means is that when you go into a doctor's office and they say, I'm going to do some tests, we'll do some blood tests and some, we'll stick a popsicle stick in your mouth and we'll bang on your knee and we'll find out what's going on here. But what we don't see is we don't see how are you doing at home? How do you get downstairs and upstairs? How do you... Um, talk with your family when you're really in pain and that, that kind of stuff. There's a whole bunch we miss. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing to go to a doctor's office because it's a really controlled setting and that's kind of a scientific way of understanding disease and disability. And it's how we've made a lot of progress is we control the setting in which these things happen and say what's different in this, regardless of all the other context. So understand that this the scientific perspective here can be really helpful but it can also miss a lot of the important nuance. And that's where rehabilitation counseling, long ago, we're talking like the 1960s, back in the civil rights, human rights movements uh, in the US, we emphasize the social model. The social model essentially says, uh, there are these barriers outside of the individual. So instead of focusing on what's going wrong inside the person and what isn't working inside them, getting rid of the virus, um, putting a limb back on if one doesn't exist, that kind of stuff. We say, what are the barriers that exist because of the way that other people are seeing that disability? So here's the classic example. 
The classic example is I am in a wheelchair and if all the curbs have this big gap where I can't get up on the curbs, then uh, we, there's no way I can navigate the world. And essentially the problem isn't me, it's the sidewalks and the curbs. Those are the barriers that are keeping me from getting access to things. It's just a simple example. Another one would be like captioning, the stuff you see right above here. Captioning means that it's not necessarily my hearing that's the problem. It's the way that, that we use, we emphasize voice so much and we emphasize sound so much in sharing information. But if we can just do stuff like that and remove that barrier that's not really a problem with the person themselves, then we can have access to things. And so the social model says, well, what's going on outside of you? Um, in that case, the problem is just how we understand disability, not disability itself. So medical model says the problem is inside the person. There's something wrong with them to be fixed. Not all bad. It sounds kind of all bad, but it's not necessarily all bad because there's a lot of good that comes out of that. And the social model says there's a lot of problems outside in the environment, in our communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's not all bad itself either. It can be easy to point to these two things and say, well, you know, it's those people that are the problem or it's the individuals the problem. We can, we can get really angry about this stuff and we can get really frustrated and say, don't call me that and don't use those words with me and all that kind of stuff. What we're trying to do here is to say, how do we get the, the, the biggest context? How do we understand what's going on inside a person and outside of a person and address both of those things uh, as much as we can so that we can help a person get access to stuff, access to the economy, access to the relationships, access to knowledge, all those things. So that's why the third one, the biopsychosocial model says there's some biological stuff going on. We learn that from the doctors and the medical field and the scientists. We need to understand that biological stuff. Us as counselors and uh, the psychology movement in general have taught us a lot about what goes on in our heads about how we understand, how we perceive, the way we respond emotionally to, to things that don't go well for us, um, the way we think about these things. And we can learn from that too. And then, of course, one of the big parts of counseling is how do we deal with the relationships, the social stuff, the way we interact with each other. If we can take into account all three of those things, maybe that'll give us a better shot at understanding the whole experience of the person, not just the way the doctors see it, not just my subjective experience. But we can say, how do we put all those pieces together to consider the complex interactions of all the stuff, right? So um, in the biopsychosocial model, it typically, and this is kind of a historical trend, although I don't think it's 100% accurate all the time, considering diagnosis as a problem. This is not something I'm going to go into at length here, but um, diagnosis can be a problem, but can also be a great and wonderful solution to helping people understand what's going on. There are situations where someone says, well, you're probably just autistic, so why don't you just go deal with that, right? And that sounds like slander. It sounds like a name that you're calling somebody. There's a whole bunch of nasty judgment that comes along with that. So in that case, diagnosis is putting a label on somebody that they probably don't deserve, and they're doing it in a way that's really not helpful. It's not really telling them information that's going to help their life improve, right? In other cases, there are uh, people who are like, I, something isn't working and I don't know what it is and I've been to umpteen doctors and they can't tell me what it is. And so finally I went to that one guy who's actually done his research or who knows things about this thing and that this, or this lady um, works particularly with this group of people and, and she said, oh, there's this rare thing or this, the, you know, there's like five people in the world that have this condition. And you say, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one. This is wonderful. Okay, now I can go do some research that's more focused on how do I deal with this? And which doctors do I talk to? And how do, which questions do I ask? And how do I inform people about what my needs are? And that kind of thing. So in this model, and in a lot of counseling models actually, there's this understanding that there's a problem here and diagnosis is part of that. Um, and this is something that I, I hope in these in uh, these lectures we can kind of get away from that and say, how do we consider diagnosis for what it is? It's just a name that we put on something. It comes with a bunch of uh, nasty context also, but there's also good things that come out of it. And so how do we take both of the, the good and the bad and put it together and say, okay, let's 
let's use that all all that information and and um, not let it make us angry and sad and feel bad about ourselves and bad about other people and all that kind of stuff. We need to protect ourselves from some of that what we call transference. Um, considers uh, social influence and how a person's experience. So that person's experience is a really important part that we'll get to more in just a little bit. Um, a person's experience, the way I conceptualize that, and a lot of counselors do as well, is it's a combination of your thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. Most psychological theories take those three things, and some of them emphasize one over the other more. So, for example, if you're thinking of the behaviorist, they said, well, I think behavior is the core function of people, and that's how we should understand what how people are acting and what they're doing and their thinking, because behavior drives their thoughts and feelings. The cognitive theorists like Aaron Beck and, and many others since him uh, have said, well, but if we just look at the dysfunctional thoughts, because the thoughts are the foundational things that happen that drive our behaviors. Other people say, well, your emotions actually are more core to the, to the, uh, the uh, what's the right word? I'm blanking on the word, but like the, the, the innermost primal parts of your brain uh, make you feel things. And then the higher order thinking processes lead to thoughts and those drive your behaviors and that kind of thing. So regardless of whether you believe one of these three things is the core thing, what we need to do is we need to understand all of them, regardless of which one was first and which one can, comes after and all that kind of stuff. We can leave that up to the theorists. But in terms of how we're conceptualizing people and what their thoughts, feelings, behaviors are, that can give us some understanding about how they're using them in their life to, to adapt and accommodate and, and cope with the difficulties of life. In fact, that's something we can do for all of us. So hopefully this makes a little bit of sense. We're going to kind of be probably talking about the social medical thing, but really we want to stay in this area and even adapt it a little bit to not, uh, not con we want to understand the problems, but more importantly, we want to understand the strengths and solutions and what do we, how do we conceptualize this stuff in a way that's really productive for us as counselors to do our work and for the people that we're working with so that they can live their lives. That's really the whole goal. When I go to the doctor, when I go see a counselor with my therapist, with the people that I'm hanging around, I want mostly to be able to just live my life and do the best that I can. So it's not about being told who I am, what I am, how I need to act and all that kind of stuff. It's about when I hang around those people, do they help me be my best self? And that's what, as counselors, we want to say, how do I create an environment where people can be their best self? That's kind of the goal here. Okay. So what is a person's experience of disability? <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of factors that go along with this. Um, personality factors are one thing. So I'm not going to go into a long explanation of how personality is developed. But the general gist of it is that we have these positive and negative experiences from birth, maybe even before that, uh, that tell us how can we get through the world? Who can we trust? What things should we be afraid of? How do we keep ourselves safe? So, you know, when babies cry, if they're fed, they say, oh, this person can meet my needs and that's great. As a baby, my need is just food and warmth. I need milk and I need a blanket. <laughs> that's basically it. And that gets more complex as we get older, as we become teenagers, we're building, we're developing our social sense of self. Who are we with these groups of people? And if there's a nasty clique of boys or girls in our high school, we say those kinds of people or these kinds of situations or whatever. And it's, uh, it gets more complex, but the general answer is that what I become is the way that I relate to other people who's safe or other people and other things who's safe and who's not. So that's kind of how I'm understanding personality and how it's developed. Um, think about these two examples. I'm the kind of person who can take care of myself or on the flip side, I'm the kind of person that really depends on other people. Both of these statements are, they come from somewhere, right? I was wrong sometime as a kid, parents, family, schools, whoever it is. And I say, I need to take matters into my own hands and do it myself. And when that client comes into a counselor and they say, I have a disability, but it's up to me to figure this out. Okay, there's one way of understanding this. On the flip side, there are people who say, I have a disability and everybody has always really helped me out. So I need you to help me out. And both of these things can have positive and negative consequences when it comes to how a client takes, takes control of their own life and takes responsibility for it, or if they do it all. Um, 
In other words, somebody with the in the first example, I can take care of myself. I don't need you. Chances are you're probably not going to see some of those clients or you're going to talk to them and say, well, here's what I think might be helpful for you based on my experience and my knowledge. And they might say, nah, I don't need that. That's just a bunch of garbage. That's what that's what shrinks do to, I don't know, make problems for people or something. I don't know what the answer is, but um, there's this attitude of like, I don't need help, which is not true because all of us need help. It just depends on for what and when. On the flip side, there's the other person who says, I need you for everything. And that can create challenges with counseling because uh, those personality factors can, can say, this disability is a problem that I don't have any sense of control over. That internal locus of control that we hope to have a little bit of um, versus an external locus of control. Everybody else is controlling me and will fix it for me and do it for me. It's sort of, we use this word kind of flippantly in our in our culture right now, but like the entitlement stuff is somebody says like, I'm entitled to your services. I'm entitled to your knowledge. I'm entitled to all this stuff because I've always been given it and I don't know what else to do it. So personality factors can uh, affect a person's experience of their own disability. Uh, social environment. I think that one's probably pretty self-explanatory. Friends, family, community, um, our, our local and national and our culture, that's part of that community thing. I see I forgot a parentheses right up there, but whatever, <laughs> my mistake. Um, and then this term I don't think was in the book, I don't remember reading it, but something about social capital. So if I have one friend, it's like having $5 in my wallet. If I have two friends, it's like having $10 in my wallet. When we talk about capital, we're talking about value. We're talking about not necessarily money, but just think of value in general. If I have a lot of capital, I can meet a lot of needs. I can go to the grocery store and I can go to the clothing store and I can go to buy myself a boat and go boating or whatever, or any of the toys that we want. It just, it, it gives us the ability, this capital gives us the ability to do things. And more importantly is when things happen, we can bounce back from them. We aren't, we aren't as burdened by like, <clears throat> excuse me again, if I have money in my wallet, I can deal with things like getting a speeding ticket. It's not going to like take money out of the fridge, something like that. But if I don't have money, I'm going to struggle more and I'm not going to have resources to meet my needs. Same thing with people. That's what social capital is. If I have lots of people around me, they can help me in times of need. That's what that is. So um, an experience of disability will differ if you don't have social capital versus if you have a lot of support, emotional behavioral, like people bringing you food and, you know, helping you up the stairs if you need that, whatever it might be. Those things can really change a person's experience. Um, how a person functions is affected by their condition, their character, and their social resources. So think of all three of those things. Remember the biopsychosocial model, their biological condition, uh, their psychological sense of self, which comes partly from their personality, which we just talked about, and uh, social resources are kind of um, well, I just explained what those are. So we're, we're bringing in all these different things here to understand disability. One of the challenges with understanding disability as a whole, and what does this word even mean? What conditions are disabling? We tend to think of the big ones that we are comfortable with, we know about, like um, blindness or deafness or um, amputations, missing limbs, that kind of thing. But do we think of these things, these glasses, is the fact that I can't see very well. I mean, I can see, but everything's blurry and sort of double when I take these off. Is that a disability? Well, sure. I mean, it's a limiting condition that would limit my functioning if I didn't have these things to help me out. Just like if I didn't have this metal hook to put on my arm to help me pick up things and open doors and that kind of stuff. If I didn't have that, it might be harder, right? I could maybe do it if I squint enough or if I use another, you know, use my my nub to open the door, whatever it is, but it, it, that's a disability. Um, when I have a hangnail on my foot and I limp a little bit, it's creating a functional limitation, right? So um, disability can be really broadly understood or it can be very specific. So what we're trying to do with stuff like this is say, well, there's gotta be limits. We can't just say like, I have a hangnail, so I have a disability. Cause that's, you know, it doesn't really deviate enough from acceptable standard. So what we consider normal is a hangnail. But what's not normal is something a little bit more limiting and where that is could be a gray area. So that's why these definitions help us out a little bit. There are 
tons of definitions and here's just a few. We're going to focus on one of them, but I just want to leave a couple here. The Americans with Disabilities Act. It defines something that's really helpful for us so we can globally understand this in a legal, a legal way. The International Classification of Disease, this is typically used by uh, the medical world. The mental health world uses it as well, but not nearly as much as the DSM-5. This is the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Kind of a mouthful, but the DSM is where we, uh, what, what we use to understand all of the symptoms and how they label a condition, in a mental health condition. Um, and then what we're really going to focus on is the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health. So there's a whole bunch to say about this, and uh, we probably won't go too deeply into it in this in this class or this series. But we're gonna um, we'll use this to understand medical conditions. When we talk about the ICD, remember I said that was the the medical uh, system of understanding disability or understanding health or whatever it is. Um, that tends to focus on more of that like scientifically founded conditions that have been uh, that I don't know exactly how to say this, but like doctors use it um, and it's more focused on the medical biological kind of stuff, right? Like um, if you have cold, it's because of this virus and we we all can understand that and, and agree on that. So we're going to use this code to explain this diagnosis for that condition, something like that. With the DSM, those are a series of psychological, behavioral, and emotional symptoms. So when we look at all the symptoms, if you say, I have this one, this one, this one, this one, and those combined, say you have that condition. Some of those you might have with a different condition, but it's a different cluster. So we use that word cluster to say this cluster of conditions, or this cluster of symptoms lead to that condition. So just take tearfulness, for example, and fatigue. Fatigue could be anxiety, could be depression, could be something uh, neurological, could be a whole bunch of things. But if you add fatigue and tearfulness, uh, plus a few others, it probably looks more like depression. And it kind of helps you say, if this one symptom could be a bunch of things, but if, it's, if, it, if these other ones exist as well, then it's probably that one. The ICF really focuses on functioning. How do these things help you get around in the world? So it's not just, it is health, it is that other stuff, it is your, your internal experience of your disability, which is kind of psychological as well, it's a little different than the DSM, but that's a different topic, I guess. But we really want to understand how does a person get around in their, how do they function in relationships, how do they get around in the world, how do they experience their own body and their own sense of self, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of the, the ballpark that we're going to be working in here. It's important to say that all of them are incomplete and all of them are missing some little piece, some little nuance that isn't quite perfect. And we're just gonna have to live with that imperfect. None of these systems of understanding disability are perfect. The medical model that we talked about, not perfect. The social model, not perfect. Biopsychosocial model, the way we understand it now, not perfect. That's why we're continuing to do this work. It's to say, how do we help people have the most possible access to their lives, to the world? How do they create to lead to a better life? How do we really focus on somebody's strengths, change the way our culture perceives disability, all this kind of stuff. So um, you can pause right now if you're using this and ask this question. It's a great way. Say, um, another way to ask this question might be, what, what ways, what are the barriers to understanding disability in a way that actually helps people? What are the barriers in our culture, in the way we think, that actually give people the best shot at living their best life, something like that. So you can do that now if you want to. So the ICF framework, I'm going to check the time here. I got to speed up a little bit. I'm yapping too much. This is going to be a problem <laughs> for most of these things. Here's a quote from the book. The experience of disability focuses on the individual and his or her personal resources, health condition, and individual environment. So here are some just definitions that will help us say, what, is the, what does health even mean? The health are the components of well-being. Function, what does that mean? It means the body stuff that we do, but it's not just body stuff, it's activities that we participate in our community also. Um, and then other definitions, I'll skip over those because you can pause if you need to uh, read those, but these help us understand what are we actually talking about here. Um, I've actually kind of mentioned some of that stuff already, so now that I've done all my 
yammering on about other things. Hopefully some of this will be already cleared up for us now. In the book, this is really important. Um, the core structure of the ICF are all these things, body function and structures, the way our body is set up, um, activities and participation, we just talked about that, environmental factors, we're going to focus on that one mostly in this, uh, in this class, and personal factors. Those are the things that are more in the wheelhouse of counseling. We want to understand body functions, and the book is going to cover a ton of that stuff. I think the two authors are both nurses, maybe, or at least one of them is. Maybe um, Donna Falvo is a nurse, um, if I'm getting that correct. Um, she talks a lot about body functions because of her professional training. But as counselors, we want to take this stuff in the book and say, well, how does, how does that affect our environmental factors? Those are in there, but we want to expand on those. Same thing with personal factors, too. And then I think this is the last one. Yeah, it's the last one. OK, maybe I'm not so far behind. <laughs> Optimal versus maximum function or performance, okay? So if you go, uh, I, I like to use the, the analogy of a weightlifter. If you have a, a weightlifter who is uh, training to, to build strength, they might say, okay, I need to figure out what's the, I need to set my record. I need to understand what's the maximum capacity that I have to lift weights. Like what's the most amount of weight that I can lift? And that would be considered the maximum capacity, the highest probably level, highest, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I made a mistake up there somewhere. Uh, highest probable level of functioning. I think that's what I was going for. In other words, what a person can do, what's the most you can lift. So if I'm doing an assessment with somebody with a disability and they say, well, I would like to go back to work and I'd like to be an auto mechanic. And I would say, okay, well, how long can you stand? How long can you kneel? Can you even get down on your back to, not that that happens anymore because they have lifts to lift up cars, but how, how long can you sustain the activity that you're wanting to do? That's basically the idea. And that's considered maximum capacity. However, just measuring what's the most a person can lift and what's the longest they can sit and what's the, all that kind of stuff, that's not really going to get us an idea of what's their endurance. What are they going to do and how do they feel when they're doing it? And is that even reasonable to say, well, if you can lift 50 pounds, then we should put you in a job that, that that's what you're going to be able to do because they're not going to be able to do it all day long. It's like I can stand here and talk to a camera, but there's a certain length of time before I need to shut up and go do something else. <laughs> you know, rest my eyes, rest my smile, um, just not be in in the zone in that moment. So maximum capacity can be helpful, but in certain circumstances. And that's one of the things that's going to take some practice for all of us to learn is in what cases do I need to understand a person's maximum limits? And then when do I need to understand their optimal functioning? And what we mean by optimal functioning is considering their individual goals. If they say, yeah, I probably could lift 50 pounds, but I just, I don't want to do that. It's going to wreck my body in 10 years. So why do I just, why don't I just get a desk job instead? Or I really want to work outside, but all that's available seems to be inside, and I just don't want to do that. So my goals really matter because, as you will learn in your career theory classes, what makes a person satisfied with their work and what they actually can do, their satisfactoriness, you'll get to that later if you haven't already, what they want to do really matters. That's why we emphasize interest inventories so much when we do uh, assessment in career counseling, disability counseling, that kind of thing. Vocational counseling, we'll say that. So um, person's goals, their personal goals, their environmental goals, that kind of stuff. So just to give this another context, maximum capacity is what a person can do, which is important sometimes. And optimal functioning is what a person does do. What do they want to do? Remember when we were talking about what happens inside the doctor's office versus what happens at home? What we really want to understand is what does a person actually do in their day-to-day -day life? And one of the, the common things that happens in counseling is someone will come in and they'll say, okay, here's my problem. Here's what I want to work on. Here's how I respond to my wife or my kids or my bosses or whatever. And then after a few sessions or after a while, sometimes a long time, you'll, they'll say, well, I was really trying to um, do something we call impression management or show my best self, or I really wasn't being completely honest even with myself about how I'm responding to other people because I'm a little bit crabbier than I thought I was or um, I, I'm not doing as well as I think I am or I'm telling you I'm doing way worse than I actually am or whatever that might be. 
what a person does do uh, is a whole nother layer of their functioning. And that's a lot of times in counseling, what we're trying to do is to say, we're hearing one story. How do we change that story to say, I actually can do more than I thought I could. And so we're making a little bit of assumption here, but the assumption is to that there's a different person underneath this layer of disability or what their current functioning is or the personality they're presenting today is not the person that they can be when they're at their best, that kind of thing. So um, hopefully this terminology helps a little bit and we'll, we'll come back to it because I don't think it's completely clear even in my head um, in terms of conceptualizing. We need some more examples, but we'll get to that as we go through the, the rest of the, the, the lectures in the book and that kind of thing. Okay, um, great. I will just leave it there and I'll talk to you guys later. See ya.